All right, guys, Murph's here. And today, we are going to talk about short barreled rifles versus braced pistols, or as I like to refer to them, three points of contact pistols. Now, a couple of caveats we got to go ahead and get out of the way right off the bat. First off, guys, I am not a lawyer, nor am I any other type of legal advisor. This conversation that we're going to have today is going to cover a lot of different legal aspects and a lot of different ever-changing rules, laws, regulations, interpretations of definitions, all that type of stuff. So, anytime you're looking to purchase these types of firearms, you need to make sure that you are fully aware of all of the new subtle nuances that are constantly surrounding this stuff. This video right now, today as I'm filming, is accurate to the best that I can make it. However, six days, six weeks, six months, six years from now, it may not be the same. So make sure you're protecting yourselves. Make sure that you're trying to get as much current information as you can. If need, if you need to speak to a lawyer before you engage in any of these activities. Now, also guys, the subjects we're going to cover today are a lot of um, hot button topics for a lot of people. There's a lot of politics and different types of things that are involved in this. This is not a political channel. Now, as much as I believe fundamentally as a gun owner, you need to be politically involved and active, I don't necessarily want to talk about the political aspects that are covered in this video here today. That can be a conversation for another time if you guys really want to have it. What I do want to identify are different aspects, different functional considerations whenever it is that you're working around these types of things, a couple of aspects of law and all that type of stuff. But I do not want this conversation to devolve into all gun laws are unconstitutional and all that kind of stuff. As, as much as that's the truth, that's not necessarily what we're talking about here today. All right. Now, with those couple of caveats out of the way, let's go ahead and identify a couple of different aspects of a legal nature. So in 1934, the National Firearms Act was signed into existence, and this act regulated the sale and purchase, manufacture, all those types of aspects of machine guns, short barrel rifles, or SBRs, short barrel shotguns, or SBS, AOWs or any other weapons, as well as suppressors. And we're primarily going to focus on SBRs here today. Now, there's a couple of different aspects that we have to take into account whenever we're talking about legal definitions of what makes these weapon systems what they are. Now, what I'm going to say to you guys are kind of like Murph's, I guess you could say layman's terms. Definitions, I will either splice in the actual legal definition in the video or I will annotate them in the description. Go ahead and check either if you're actually interested in seeing what the true legal definition is. So, what constitutes a rifle? Well, according to the legal definition, a rifle is in possession of a stock and then also a rifle barrel. And a stock is a thing that you intend to place against your shoulder in order to be able to stabilize the weapon system. And a rifle barrel is a long hollow tube that has spirally wound rifling lands and grooves and all that type of stuff cut into it in order to be able to stabilize a projectile. Now, what makes a short barreled rifle? Well, whenever we talk about rifles, we're talking about weapon systems that are in excess of 16 inches in order to be a non-NFA item, not require you to have to pay a $200 tax stamp and register with the ATF in order to be able to own. Anything below 16 inches in barrel length, also having been in possession of a stock, is now considered to be a rifle or a short barreled rifle at that point. Now there's a couple things that we have to take into account. How do we measure barrel length on a rifle? Well, that measurement is taken from the chamber to the manufactured end of the barrel. This is a very important distinction here. This is a very key thing. What constitutes the manufactured end of the barrel? Well, it's the end that you can't change anything on. So if you take the, a standard AR-15 barrel, it would be the threaded end of the muzzle, not the muzzle device. We'll get into that a little bit more here in a second. The muzzle device on a standard AR-15 can be swapped out at your will. So that is not a reliable position to be able to take a legal measurement from because it may change over time. You swap in a muzzle brake, you swap in a, a flash hider or something like that, that might make little bits of changes to the overall barrel length. So that threading is where you actually take the measurement from. Now, manufactured end. What constitutes a manufactured end? Now there is a thing that is done in the firearms community where we take a 14 and a half inch barrel. That means that the threaded end is at 14 and a half inches. And then someone will permanently attach 
a muzzle device that is in excess of 1.5 inches long. Now, what constitutes permanent attachment in this case? Well, that is the muzzle device being pinned and welded in place. Now, even though that's technically removable, it would require tools and a lot of energy and effort in order to be able to remove it, which therefore makes it now the manufactured end of the barrel. You now have a 16 inch barreled gun. And you can do the same kind of thing with really any shorter barrel that you want to, as long as you pin and weld the extension into place and it comes out to the legal 16 inches. Now, what constitutes a pistol in this case? Well, a pistol is a weapon system that's meant to be fired from your hand and has a rifle, barrel, you know, spiral round, wound, lands and grooves and all that kind of stuff all over again. But the big thing is that you fire it with one hand or capable of being fired with one hand. Now, this is where things get a little bit interesting because we have a thing that is known as braced pistols or three points of contact pistols. Now, you first kind of see this type of thing pop up in about the 1980s, 1990s. Now, previously, people have been building pistols out of rifle caliber weapon systems. Plainfield Machine Company actually produced a pistol variant of the M1 carbine. It did not have a stock. It had a super short barrel and could ostensibly be fired with one hand. Now also you had companies that were manufacturing single shot rifle caliber pistols that did not possess stocks or anything else and were meant to be used with long eye relief magnified optics for hunting or perhaps silhouette shooting, things along that nature. Thompson Center is someone who's still producing some guns along that same principle here today. I realize I've been talking for a while, hadn't refreshed my, uh, uh, my palate, my mouth there. All right, so in the 1990s, we start to see things like the Bushmaster Carbon 15, which was an AR-15 looking short barreled setup. However, it did not have a stock. It didn't even have a handguard in its original makeup and had what we would refer to now as a pistol receiver extension or a pistol buffer tube, which means that it did not have the cutouts in order to be able to have an adjustable stock installed. Now, eventually, you would see those receiver extensions covered with a little bit of foam so that you could put it up against your cheek, giving yourself a third point of contact, but not necessarily allowing the metal to get hot in the sun or anything like that, and it would be something relatively comfortable to be able to place against your cheek. Now, in about, if I remember correctly, it was 2013, if I was wrong, I'll annotate it appropriately. A company called SB Tactical came out with a pistol brace. And the intention of this design was to be able to have that weapon system utilized by people with arm injuries of some sort, be it amputation or perhaps people who didn't have like full use of their hands and all that kind of stuff, so that they could attach that brace to their forearm and then have that third point of contact to be able to stabilize an AR-15 pistol. Now, this product has expanded ever since then with a wide variety of different manufacturers and models available, adaptable to a wide variety of pistol type platforms, AKs and otherwise, in order to have it be better used by not just those without a lot of dexterity. See, this would also cause a bit of a stir because if you look at the even the original SP Tactical design, at first glance, just looking at its form, you might assume that it's a stock. It technically, by the legal definition, is not. However, a lot of people started to make that leap. And as it turns out, you are physically capable of being able to press it against your shoulder. However, that has caused quite a bit of stir in political and legal type facets. Now, the original determination was that the Brace was completely legal as long as it was used as intended. What became the issue was when people started pressing the brace to the shoulder and there was a real legal issue for the ATF in trying to discern whether or not that constituted intent to manufacture an SBR just by pressing the weapon system to your shoulder, which caused initially the ban of the practice of putting a brace to your shoulder. It would automatically constitute an SBR if you did so. Eventually, the ATF would change their ruling on that particular aspect and would declare that there was no improper way to shoot a pistol, which means that I could take something like, oh, I don't know, a Glock 17 and put the slide up against my shoulder and pull the trigger. And as much as that would be a very silly decision to make for a wide variety of reasons, no real addition to accuracy, potential injury to the actual shooter, uh, causing a malfunction, inducing a malfunction in the weapon system and all that kind of stuff, 
I legally would not be manufacturing an SBR because there's no wrong way to shoot a handgun. However, it would be a conversation that would be revisited by the ATF yet again and here most recently, at least as of this filming, in which now they are trying to determine braces to be reclassified as stocks and these three points of contact pistols relabeled as SBRs. All right, so that kind of gives us like the background story to this overall conversation, right? Some of the, some of the nuances and, and clarifications that have been had to have been made along the way. Let's get into what may, what might make you want to pick one over the other. Now, honestly, guys, there's not a whole lot of reason to pick a SBR over a three points of contact pistol, if I'm being completely honest. So you have a couple of different things that impact that. Whenever you get into NFA items, you have to send up a request to the ATF to be able to purchase and or build that particular item. Now, if you're already in possession of the item at that point in a legal type format, so uh, it's a 16 inch barreled rifle that you are petitioning the ATF to allow you to cut down to a shorter overall length, or you have an AR or AK pistol that you're petitioning the AK, the, excuse me, you're petitioning the ATF to allow you to be able to place a stock onto it, whatever it may be, you at the very least can shoot it in whatever config legal configuration it's in until you get the determination back from the ATF. If you're purchasing one, it sits in limbo. Now, this comes into a difference between Form 1s and Form 4s and when it comes to wait time. If you are purchasing a ready-built SBR, just like a suppressor or an SBS, you're going to have a longer overall wait period, possibly in excess of nine months. However, if you build an SBR, you generally have a shorter overall wait time. It took 42 days for me to get my SBR paperwork back. Now. Of course, that was still a month and a half that I had to wait in order to be able to do whatever it is that I please with my legally owned property. However, I still, it was, it was still fairly fast and it wasn't nine months long, so I can appreciate that at least. Now, depending on what state you're in, you can go in and buy an AR or AK three points of contact pistol and probably or possibly leave there the same day. It comes down to a lot of your local laws and that's the same kind of thing with even SBR ownership for that matter. There are some states that do not allow the ownership of SBRs. There's some municipalities that do not allow the ownership of SBRs. Same kind of thing with three points of contact pistols as well. You gotta know your local laws before you engage in this type of activity. Now, there's also another legal matter that comes in whenever you're talking about SBRs and that is crossing state borders. Legally, you cannot cross a state border with your SBR without having notified the ATF beforehand through a form 5320.20. And a recent change that's been made in the past couple of years is that the ATF has to reply to you before you move across the border. And that form, you're, you clarify where it is that you're going, the address of where it is that you're going, that's the, that's the place that the weapon will be stored. You're you know, more or less at that point agreeing that you will follow proper procedures for storing that weapon system so a prohibited person cannot have access to it, as well as the duration of your visit. Now, I have filed 5320.20s before and it's taken about 12 days to get them back. So. That's actually a huge improvement. Guys, honestly, having dealt with the ATF for a little while, the, the e-file capability that we now have uh, is really fantastic as compared to what it used to be. It was a headache trying to do all that stuff by mail with them, and it's fantastic that we can do it all electronically now. Now, you don't necessarily have those issues with three points of contact pistols, again, depending on local state laws. Now, another aspect is carrying the rifle or the pistol with one in the chamber. A lot of that's going to come down to state laws yet again. The state that I live in now, you cannot legally transport a rifle with a round in the chamber. You can have a loaded magazine, you cannot necessarily have a round in the chamber. Pistols, on the other hand, you can. And since, regardless of whether or not it's braced or three points to contact, AR, AK, whatever the pistol may be, it still falls under a pistol classification, which means that it falls under pistol laws. Now, that's both good and bad. If you live in a state where you have to have a wait period in order to be able to possess a pistol, then that's gonna also impact your three points of contact pistol. If you live in a buy here, leave here state, it's not a big deal. 
Now, that also comes back to potentially concealed carry permits and all that kind of stuff. If you are not in possession of a concealed carry permit and you have a loaded three points of contact pistol in your vehicle, that might put you in violation of concealed carry type provisions depending on local state laws. Just something to keep in mind, guys. Something to stay on top of overall. You've, you've really got to get into this kind of thing if you want to stay on, if you want to stay out of jail. Now, something else to keep in mind, guys, when it comes to playing around with SBR type regulations and all that kind of stuff, having an illegal SBR or doing something illegal with an SBR comes to 10 years in jail and hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. So that's what we're gambling whenever we talk about these aspects, in addition to being a felon and not being able to purchase firearms and all that kind of stuff in the future. All right, so with that being the case, what are some of my kind of like closing thoughts on the SBR pistol type dynamic. Well guys, for me personally, I have an SBR because I want to have whatever I can have. Like whatever I can get my hands on, I want to have it. And I, and I want to do it legally, as legally as I can. So I plan on having far more than just one SBR. I plan on having as many SBRs as I can get my hands a hold of and I will make sure that I can do so legally. They will Go, I'll go through all the proper paperwork and all that kind of stuff like I'm supposed to do. Am I going to chafe every minute of it? Absolutely. It is silly that I should have to ask to be able to do this type of thing. However, that's where we stand. And in order to be able to maintain my status as a law-abiding gun owner, I do have to obey the law. So that's kind of how I, I look at that process overall. I'm going to have it because I can. Just like when I was in Germany, where, which has a very very strict gun law approach to legal type affairs, I still possessed firearms. I just went through the process to be able to do so because ownership of firearms is more important to me than the rigmarole that I have to go through in order to be able to express my rights. Now, at some point, I do still want to have a pistol type set up for cross-border travel just to make it a little bit easier. But if I know far enough in advance, I'm going to put in the request to be able to take my SBR because that's what I built the SBR for. And I really like it for that type of setup. I'm not going to tell you one way or the other what you should do or shouldn't do. All I'm going to tell you is try to make sure that you're legal and forthright in whatever it is that you're doing. One of the great things that I actually really like is that it's not that hard to build an SBR and it's a shorter overall wait time to be able to do it. So I would suggest getting one of these three points of contact pistols and shooting and training with it as a three points of contact pistol until you get your tax stamp back and then make it an SBR if you want to or not. Either way is acceptable. And the last thing that I would say, guys, is be active. If you don't like something that's going on with gun laws right now, let your representatives know. Let your elected officials know that you want them to make changes that benefit their constituents or you will find someone who can or will be willing to make those types of changes. All right, that's the most that I want to get as far as political goes on this, guys. That's pretty much what I got. I hope you found this interesting. And have a good day.